Good morning. My name is Rob Ramrath, and I'm a GCA host on GCA Studios, brought to you by the Game Change Agency. And today I'm going to be talking with Pratt Mogay, the founder and CEO of Casina Big Data as a Service. And we'll be having a conversation about people's response and reaction to change. Good morning, Pratt, and thanks for joining me. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me over. Thank you. Let me take a moment to introduce Pratt. First of all, his bio is on the website, so you can see a lot of detail of his extensive career. But suffice it to say that Pratt's an accomplished and successful serial entrepreneur with over 18 years of service. He worked with IBM upon its acquisition of Natiza. Pratt gives back to the community as well, where he was the president of Thai Boston, whose mission is to foster successful entrepreneurship. And of course, presently, he's founder and CEO of Casina Big Data as a Service. Hopefully, some of you have had the opportunity to take a look at my interview with Jay Leader about change in the context of big established organization. I've known Pratt for a few years now, and he came to mind as a perfect complement to Jay, where we could discuss change through the lens of a smaller entrepreneurial organization and surely there would be rather profound differences. But let me frame this up for a moment. I'm not going to take as much time to frame this as I did with Jay's interview, because I'm hoping you've seen that. You heard me comment about that change has been written about all the way from uh, Buddha, 500 DC, BC, he talked about change, that change is everything, nothing remains without change. And then of course we had Who Moved My Cheese, Clay Christensen's seminal book on the innovator's dilemma. So it's been around for a long time. I talked about, of course, major disruptors in industries such as Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. We don't have to go into to any detail on that. Of course, Amazon is changing everything. But an aspect of change that I wanna really get into is very specifically is ambiguity. I think people struggle a lot with ambiguity. It's one thing when people know about change as going from point A to point B when both are clearly defined, but it's a real struggle when people know that point A, upon which their business is grounded, their skills are grounded, point A starts to actually disintegrate in front of them and they have no idea what point B looks like or where it is. You can see this happening with brick and mortar retail, how everybody is struggling in the context of Amazon, the Goliath, you can look ahead at network TV and cable providers. We all know that they're heading for a wipeout, but nobody knows what point B is going to be. My belief, Pratt, is as a serial entrepreneur, you eat change and ambiguity for lunch, that indeed you are defining point B. So it's a pleasure for you to move away from point A that you don't establish yourself in at all and create a point B. So first, let's learn a little bit about you and some of the changes and disruptions along your career. Could you give us some idea of how you've encountered change and big stories of your past? Thanks, Rob. Um, so first off, I, I would say that this is a great topic you picked, um, the, the change topic and um, ambiguity as it relates to change. Uh, my personal background is I uh, trained as a technologist, started my career at Bell Labs, um, and so, very much foundationally joined a group of people who are all about disrupting and inventing uh, the next new idea. Um, and, uh, and and really had a great time there and learned a lot of the, the first principles in terms of, um, you know, you just essentially think out of the box, you have no constraints. And that's how people created, you know, Unix and C and C++ and many other disruptions coming out of Bell Labs. And I worked in with these researchers and uh, that's how I started my career. And since I've done several startups which have started either from ground zero or they've been startups that have scaled up uh, all the way uh, being inside really large companies like IBM. Um, and, uh, and, and recently, you know, four years back, I started a company called Kazina, Big Data as a Service, which is um, essentially the mission is to take uh, medium and large companies uh, to the cloud for their analytics. Um, and then that's sort of the next big transformation we see coming. And so I've been 
really excited, um, blessed, fortunate to be um, here, uh, you know, witnessing many of these transformative industry cycles, right? Um, and, and so as be, being part of the industry, I've sort of experienced both sides of it, uh, uh, being in the shoes of incumbents who's, who can, were experiencing disruption being done to them, as well as, um, you know, being in a startup that's trying to disrupt the status quo, um, as well as working with uh, many companies, customers and enterprises that are themselves part of this change that's going on because we are partnering with these enterprises. And in many cases, we are helping them uh, transform themselves or, or um, prevent themselves from being disrupted and then staying leaders. So, uh, so that's been my journey and, um, and uh, I'm excited to join you here on this uh, sort of a stim stimulating thread. Um, so thanks again. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pratt. That's an amazing setup to a career of entrepreneurship starting out at Bell Labs. Wow. Um, I'm going to I'm going to read something here. I, I found a quote uh, from an Upwire podcast by Dr. Robert Cooper, and I thought it was rather profound. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it verbatim. So if you you would just stick with me for a minute. So here's the quote: Left to its own devices, the brain is hardwired to steadily and stubbornly die instead of grow. How? In part by firing old neural habits or circuits that are less in touch with new opportunities than last hour or yesterday or before. And the past habits defensiveness of the brain's view puts it at natural odds with testing new approaches for better, faster or higher results. Why? Mostly because the brain is inherently wired to try to keep everything the same as in the past. Whether that's last hour, last week, last year, or a decade or more ago. Exceptional leaders and teams repeatedly choose to grow faster than the world is changing. Wow. If this is true, it could explain a lot about change resistance. What do you think about this? Yeah, blame it on our brain, right? There you go. So uh, that's a really interesting observation. Uh, one uh, sort of seminal study, uh, you know, done, if you've read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by Professor Kahneman, um, which is sort of really a seminal book that has um, impacted many um, industries, particularly marketing and messaging and, uh, uh, and the way you deal with change. Uh, his observation is that, you know, brain essentially has two systems, system one and system two. System one is sort of like the frontal system where it's all about reacting fast and it's all about instinct. Uh, so, uh, and system two is the slow and deliberate process that's going on in the brain and it's all about building context uh, patterns over time. And uh, system two does not change very often. System one, on the other hand, is all about real time processing of uh, immediate things like tiger shows up, you know, what do I do, right? Um, but the system two is all about the context, like I'm in a jungle versus I'm in the city versus I'm now interviewing. And then so there is a context setup. And I think one of the challenges we have in general is that the system two doesn't change very often. And, and there's a good reason for it because you don't want it to change very often. The, the kind of work you would, it would constantly have to do to adapt would pretty much lead to thrashing. Um, so, um, so I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole premise here is uh, to deal with change with more uh, frequent change. I think the key is to figure out if our system too can be adapted uh, to be able to deal with more frequent changes. Uh, rather than sort of have this system that's all static, wired, rarely changes, because I think the brain has a tendency to reduce the entropy and um, do minimum work, right? Like it's essentially, if you think about it, it's almost like it's, it's uh, reduced the power consumed by only <laughs> firing a certain number of circuits. Um, and if that can work, then it's great. Um, every time you see a system one input that is completely different and jarring, um, that goes into the system to database and over time it starts to change the rules. Um, and so I think coming back to your observation, I think it's all about 
by nature, I think everyone's brain is tuned to doing minimum work to be most efficient. Um, what you have to do is figure out how to, if we can train it um, to wake up to the reality that, um, you know, these, the context itself is changing more frequently than it used to. Interesting. It, it's, it's striking to me, Pratt, that despite the fact that you're a serial entrepreneur and you're leading an entrepreneurial startup organization, you still as a leader and an executive have to take a rather cerebral approach uh, to understanding uh, the, the, the wiring, the brain, and, and what it is that helps to motivate people in the face of change. So a question, you've led people in established organizations and startups. Are there any intrinsic differences in the people who are attracted to each type of organization such that change and dealing with ambiguity may be easier for some types of folks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say in, in general, um, the average uh, level of, let's call it the average level of uncertainty or ambiguity that um, an employee in a startup uh, can deal with is in general higher than the average level of uncertainty that uh, an employee of a large company um, may have, like everything else being the same, right? No. Um, but within the company, there is always this variance of people around that average uh, in terms of people who can accept a, uh, or tolerate a higher level of risk, um, higher level of ambiguity, um, higher level of creativity, higher, uh, you know, ability to be comfortable and actually thrive on uncertainty versus people whose first reaction is to resist change, ask questions on why, why not. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that spectrum of um, people who, who thrive on change or almost drive change versus people who are reluctant to change and are sort of put the brakes on change uh, I think that spread exists even in a startup, but it's all around that average, which is you know more uncertain. I think, um, and uh, and so even in a startup, I think we face the same degree of challenges because we're trying to move faster in, than in a larger company. So you've got the same uh, issues with velocity and constant you know ability to change angles and change direction because you've got a, a bunch of passionate people who believe in passionate ideas. Um, and so it's hard for them, for, the, for um, a founder to go to them and say, hey, we had assumptions A when we started, now it's an assumption B, right? Um, because the same guys who got attracted to an idea are now being told that there's a pivot and now there's a new idea or there's a new market or there's a new uh, product that we got to build. So, so I think you have the same degree of uh, uh, in some sense, the challenge of um, advocating change, uh, primarily because change happens much faster in a startup, uh, constantly in the journey. There is never a moment where what you've decided is your goal, and what you're building as a product, who you're going as a customer, what's your go-to-market, um, is all uh, fixed um, over the next three years. It just right. doesn't happen. Like, I haven't seen a startup that does it. And maybe the, if there is one, hats off to them, but in most cases I have seen, um, you make an idea, you have a vision, you start with it, and then you're constantly, constantly changing and evolving every assumption you make. You're testing, you're failing, uh, and you constantly need to take your team with it um, and, and push the team to actually think about new ways to get them. That's not easy. Well, isn't it true that established companies who fail to behave that way that's what imperils their existence. Right. Absolutely. Do you have any techniques whereby when you bring people on board to your startup, where you endeavor to understand their ability to deal with, you used words, of, we've used words change, you brought up the word risk, which of course is very important as well, uh, and, and the ambiguity such that uh, first of all, you actually might evaluate whether or not to bring them on board based on that because of the differences that you experience in the startup environment. 
or might help you understand uh, how to place them well. I would assume some roles are better lent to somebody who uh, can deal with change versus has greater difficulty with change. Right, yes. Um, certainly, I, I would say hiring somebody into a startup, um, I think th this uh, ability to um, thrive on change, and I sort of call it one of the um, leadership principles, which is you know the ability to um, look at the, an opportunity, identify an opportunity, uh, understand how you get there, being able to deal with uh, changed assumptions is an important thing that uh, we look for when we're looking at um, employees. And, and one way to sort of one lead indicator uh, of that is to actually, when you're interviewing employees, is to actually understand their past experiences, whether they've been in larger companies or smaller companies, uh, to understand how often something has changed in their environment, whether it's a project, whether it's an, a product they're working on, um, have they changed roles, um, how, how um, you know, and, and sort of balancing that with longevity, because you also want employees that are not just constantly flipping from one thing to the other. You want uh, employees that have successfully created an outcome, uh, but during that, that success, there's been a lot of change that has gone through, uh, but they've been able to deal and overcome uh, all that ambiguity and they sort of mastered change and, and uh, essentially ma manage risk uh, of different kinds. So we do look for that. Um, again, like I said, not every person is going to have the same level of uh, um, maturity in terms of dealing with that. Um, so we do look for certain roles where that's important, like um, people whose job is to say no versus people whose job is to go find the next new thing to do. Um, and also we look for certain roles where people have to balance both, which is also really hard. Um, good example is product management in uh, a startup is a key part of, you know, uh, establishing the roadmap, looking at competitive landscape, looking at what customers are asking for. And so you're constantly thinking about, you know, new features and new capabilities, but you want to balance that with uh, things like resilience, things like, you know, making sure existing customers are happy, um, quality is high, um, and there's lots of reasons not to try and build, you know, um, for five different customers asking for five different things, so there is this balance between velocity um, and focus. And so we, um, you know, in, to some extent, what we're trying to do is in a startup, successful startup, you're trying to embed that thinking uh, into every engineer and every person in the company so that everyone needs to be a mini product manager thinking about managing his or her work in terms of what's the input, what's the output, what's success, and um, how do I get there fast? Uh, rather than having like a committee or a single person out there who's like, no, you're not gonna do these 36 features, right? Um, and so that's the mindset I would say that, that is important in, in a startup is to, uh, is to build that kind of an awareness and context in every employee. Yeah, I loved it that you just referred to committees and the risks of committees. I've heard it said that a camel is a racehorse designed by committee. <laughs> That's right. Uh, probably not intended for a desert. Yeah. <laughs> can ambiguity be an asset? Uh, how? How can ambiguity use, be used to help people with their response and reaction uh, to change? I think it's a huge asset, Rob, and um, and I would say it's a it's a differentiator now, particularly because um, in, in the world where very few people can uh, respond to or effectively thrive on change, uh, if you can thrive and uh, work on change, then you have an edge uh, that somebody else doesn't. And uh, the other thing I would say is um, uh, it's an asset because ultimately, if you can deal with ambiguity. Uh, at work. It's just a, it's the same pattern everywhere else in life, which is, you know, there are things outside your control um, and things can happen, good things, bad things, things out of the left field. If you have the ability to deal with that adversity, health issues, family issues, um, what I'm finding is people are just happier. Uh, they're less stressed. 
um, they are able to um, work better socially with each other. They're able to empathize, which is really an important quality. Um, and, and they're able to roll with the punches much better than people who are, you know, all coming in thinking, you know, this is what going to happen, you know, no matter, come net, no matter what. If it doesn't happen, um, the world is over, sky is falling, um, right? I'm going to go find the next company that gives me that level of certainty and, uh, you know, security. And it doesn't exist anymore. Like, look around you. Every large company, as you know, is being disrupted. Um, and, um, and there's no safe haven anymore. So I think um, when I started down in this business, people would ask me, like, um, why would you do startups? Startups are, you know, there's no security in that, in a startup. I have come to the conclusion that there's probably the most security in a startup because at least you are create, trying to create the future uh, that you believe in uh, rather than being beholden to somebody else who's creating the future and you don't know what it is. Um, right. So, um, you know, again, I'm not necessarily saying it's about large companies or startups, but um, I think it's fundamentally about assembling groups, whether they're in startups or large companies, that are fundamentally about um, identifying an opportunity that is disrupting the status quo. And it's about going in, defining an outcome around it. And during that um, journey, change is going to be inevitable. So you may not get to the same outcome you started with when you started. But I think if you've created that mindset that it's okay, um, our value is in uh, creating, um, you know, benefits with these customers, how and when and what's the extent of it, we'll, it's TBD, we'll figure it out over time. Um, then you get, I think you're, you're able to uh, get people that thrive on it. And so I think ambiguity is, I would say, thriving on ambiguity is a, a uh, big leadership principle that um, all of us have to uh, get better at. And, and unfortunately, no MBA teaches you that. Um, so it's one of those things where um, my belief is that the way you, you create that in an organization is you just be very open and transparent with your, uh, with your, company, with your uh, team. Um, you share what's good, what's bad. Uh, you share about which customers are happy, why are they not buying. Um, did we make the right assumptions in our product? Did, is our go-to-market working? Um, what are our strengths? What are, what's our secret? Like, what's our secret sauce? What's our differentiator? Uh, what's our knitting? And what should we do here? I think the more open and transparent you are, and the more you can motivate your teams um, to work with you, the more you can roll up your sleeves, work with them, um, and, uh, and share that it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. It works. Um, the other thing I would say is much like, much like waterfall versus um, being agile. Uh, these are methodologies in terms of building products or building sort of business processes. Same kind of an approach can be used for ambiguity, which is instead of thinking about goals and expectations and success in big chunks, you can define um, those in smaller milestones. Um, and that way you are always failing fast if something's not working. Um, and so what you're doing is incremental changes along the way um, lead to potentially a huge change over time, but the team doesn't realize it because every time they're noticing a small change. Um, and that's a good way to get our system two in the brain to accept change because every time it, it's not like somebody's coming to you and saying, um, we're getting out of this business and you're going completely different. You're just, all you're coming and saying is, you know what, we're going to go target those new customers now. And then over time, you're like, you know what, you're going to change your product a little bit. Then you're like, I'm going to change the sales teams a little bit. And before you know it, you've suddenly gone from um, an on-premises appliance company to a cloud company that is doing analytics. And, and everything has been retooled. You don't realize it because you've just done one degree shift at a time. You've done it over every quarter. If you know what I mean. Absolutely. I, um, you make so many excellent points, Pratt. The point on transparency, radical transparency, I have experienced the same thing in my career, is to always bias towards just telling the truth, telling the reality as you know it, giving all the information you possibly can to your people engenders 
uh, trust in them. It engenders enthusiasm. It helps them with the change. And there's nothing but positives. I've never been burned, so to speak, by being too transparent. Obviously, you have to use common sense in terms of contractual confidentiality and things like that. But in terms of trusting your employees to be able to to hold confidences in terms of uh, intellectual property that your company has or concerns that you may have, it's absolutely vital to getting them on board and following you. That's all part of the leadership. Let's go up the ladder a little bit, so to speak. We've been talking about people. Let's now talk about organizations. Uh, so uh, Kazina, Big Data as a Service, from an organization perspective, a leadership team perspective, uh, organizations themselves, you mentioned, or we mentioned you've been with IBM, Bell Labs, Natiza, Kazina. Uh, they have their own reactions at the corporate level, so to speak, that aren't necessarily the same as the individual reactions. Uh, talk to me about the range of reactions that organizations uh, can offer to change, that respond and react. And what are the characterizations of organizations that tend to thrive through change and thrive in ambiguity versus become frozen and entrench themselves and so forth? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, I think it all starts with building a team of, um, you know, sort of well-rounded individuals that are looking at uh, all aspects of business, right? So typically, whether it's a, and then this applies to large companies or small, but essentially if you think about like a GM or a, or a single unit, which is, has a PL responsibility, um, you know, you typically have somebody who's driving the product, you know, somebody who's driving sales and marketing and partnerships and support. Um, I think it starts with a, uh, you know, a plan which is basically on a certain cadence, you know, could be a quarterly plan, a monthly plan mm -hmm. um, with goals, with metrics, um, and this understanding of, you know, to get to that uh, point of a milestone, what are, uh, what's our, how are we going to get there? Where are we going and how are we going to get there? Uh, and who is doing what to be able to get there? I think this idea of uh, being able to spell out a goal, very simple, like, we're going to get to five customers or we are going to go prove that this kind of market exists or we are going to um, compete better with this customer. Whatever that outcome is, you're going to create uh, an awesome product experience with this first prototype. Um, it is really important to be able to be clear on communication, on goals, and saying that that's our focus, by the way, and that means that some of these other things that we've been working on, they are secondary. So I think I, I find in many cases, ambiguity hurts because uh, companies are not clear on what the goal really is. And if the idea is to always hedge, um, then uh, ambiguity makes it worse. And ambiguity is part of that concept of hedging, which is we think that is important, but we also think this is important. And by the way, we also think this is equally important, right? Um, and so I think this idea of this is really important, this is secondary, uh, if this happens, that's great, but this is really important for us, is a, is, is a, is a key part of this plan, with, whether it's monthly, quarterly, yearly, depending on uh, what makes sense. But then it's all about getting together often enough with your teams to see how are we doing. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be a super formal meeting, but it's all about meaningful information being exchanged in this team to say, um, what's holding us back? Where are we? And what could we do if we are behind that plan or something's not working out? What do we do? Do we course correct? Do we add more resources? That simple thing is, makes all the difference, in, in my opinion, in terms of execution. A good live example is if you look at, um, uh, if you look at Tesla right now, and if you just look at the whole Model 3 um, situation where Elon Musk has promised a certain number. Uh, the street obviously, you know, is in a tizzy with like, uh, you know, the world is over, you know, this is not going to work. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to Elon Musk or, or his, his thing is, 
you know, I have a problem. I'm going to go figure out how to fix it. If it's either the right team or the right approach, I'm going to roll up, roll up my sleeves. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to sleep there. And I'm going to figure out how to fix the problem. Um, so it's all about that mindset because the reality is problems over time, but, you know, uh, can be fixed. Um, it's just about, you know, understanding that that is the most important problem to focus on. If you have the right teams. Uh, I mean, you've been at Bose. You, you know this very well. Um, it's all about focus and execution and the right people um, and then the right team. And if you create that kind of a quality, uh, everyone goes to bat for you. There are people who will not sleep, um, people who will literally give everything they got because uh, you are there with them in the trenches. Um, so I think it's all about that focus. It's all about transparency, uh, being, being very clear. What's your job? Because this is the other thing that happens when, when you're in a hard charging environment, it's really important to be also delegate and say, this is your, your work, this is your job, this is how it helps the other. Uh, too often you'll find hard charging environments are ones where um, they're not collegial um, and it's all about, you know, all or nothing kind of uh, the system. So it's also important to have that team around with you uh, and, and uh, make it very clear that somebody is not going to be successful if others are not part of that initiative. And so being able to then align their metrics in terms of what they produce, you know, why it's important, what's holding you back, that kind of a, a tone goes a long way. Um, so I, I sort of feel that as I've looked at companies, small or large, uh, it's about creating accountability, it's focus, it's communication, uh, it's delegation, um, it's also about coming back and being open about, hey, we missed last quarter's goals. Why? We missed them because we made wrong assumptions. We were not realistic. Um, maybe there's no market here. Should we try something else? Um, is, is an extremely important thing. And I think too often companies believe that something is going fine. Uh, they're not open enough. And by that point, you've invested so much that it's sort of sunk cost. It's hard to do course, course correction then. Right. Absolutely. Well, Pratt, you have done a marvelous job. I was going to ask you a wrap up question, but you have done a marvelous job wrapping up for us. I think you have painted a very clear picture as to the contrast between large and small organizations, very entrepreneurial organizations. I think you've also done a very good job showing yourself as a leader and why it must be a lot of fun, not only working in a startup, but working for you. So I thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time we meet. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. Talk later.